How can I know anything? <sighs> Hello, my dearest friends, and welcome to part six of my introduction to philosophy. If you're here for the first time, I just want to say that this is the sixth episode of a larger series. This series draws a very basic and accessible outline of European philosophy through a number of key themes and classical thinkers. If you're interested in this topic, please make sure to watch all videos in the right order, as each part builds on the previous ones. For your convenience, I have created a playlist in which everything is properly organized. You can find the link in the description below. Moreover, to help you even further, on my website, for every single topic of discussion, I included a list of suggested readings. That said, if you like what I'm doing here, please subscribe to this channel and allow its notifications. In this way, you will get my videos as soon as I'm posting them. I plan to share with you many more exciting materials on Eastern and Western philosophy, world religions, literature, photography, film, political theory, and history. I hope to see you again. In any event, I remain deeply grateful for your time and interest. In the last video, I have tried to give you an idea as to what metaphysics is. I have uncovered, or you could say barely covered, three separate definitions. Namely, metaphysics as the study of being, of final causes, and of reality. I have ended the fifth episode of our series by asking whether it is even possible to know what being, cause, and reality are. For that reason, we have to delve a little bit deeper into the problem of knowledge, or what philosophers call epistemology. A few quick warnings before anything else. I have divided this part into three separate sections. If you wish to get a fuller picture of epistemology, please watch all three videos. Also, since my purposes are purely introductory, I will survey only some very basic issues. As a field of study, epistemology is overwhelmingly vast and tackles problems which I won't ever be able to cover in the limited space of the current series. Nevertheless, I still hope to give you a clue or two as to what this distinct and distinguished discipline of philosophy is all about. So, on to epistemology. You should know by now that I love to preface my analysis with a short etymological discussion. This is no exception. This strange term, um, epistemology, is a combination of two ancient Greek words, episteme, which means knowledge, and logos, which means both theory and discourse. Therefore, epistemology designates a large body of philosophical theories which try to clarify the nature, criteria, and limits of human knowledge. To be a bit more specific, some of the key questions of epistemology are 1. Is knowledge possible at all? If it is, how far can it get? Can we know the whole truth or only a part of it? Might it also be the case that knowledge isn't possible at all, and if so, why? In short, how do we know that our beliefs about reality are actually and objectively true? That is to say, valid everywhere, at all times, and independently of our existence. 2. What are the criteria by which we could declare something to be true knowledge and something else mere opinion? By the same token, how is falsehood possible? 3. What exactly in our nature allows us to know anything for sure? Which faculties are more conducive to knowledge and which ones predispose us to illusion, self-deception, and by implication to being wrong? 4. What's the relation between what we can know and what we can say? Can human knowledge be thoroughly articulated? 
Is there anything we know which completely escapes or transcends our verbal capacities? These are just a few of the basic questions. Needless to say, epistemologists have addressed many other important problems during the long history of their discipline. If you're interested in knowing more about it, I just wanted to mention that in the books recommended on my website, you will find other key issues. As to what I personally intend to do, I will do my best to explain how five classical Western thinkers have answered some of the questions enumerated above. And because I sometimes like to take things in chronological order, I will start with an ancient philosopher who never disappoints, Plato. In part 5 of this series, I already alluded to the fact that according to Plato, the highest reality belongs to forms or ideas. I explained there that each individual form is perfect, eternal, and unchanging, and that all of these ideal forms make up a world which is separate and fully independent from ours. Moreover, for Plato, the external world of our everyday experience represents just an imperfect copy or image of this divine kingdom of ideas. If you need to refresh your memory about Plato's metaphysics, I'll include the link to part 5 in this video's description so you can watch it again at your leisure. Now, even if we accept that Plato's metaphysics is true, there are some important questions that immediately arise. These are, if forms dwell in a completely separate realm, can we ever become aware of them? And admitting that this awareness is possible, could we ever know anything besides the mere fact that they exist, say, something about their inner structure or relation to each other? Plato responds in the affirmative to both questions. His explanation as to why this is the case has to do with his distinct theory of knowledge, otherwise known as the theory of recollection or anamnesis. To understand this theory, you have to remember that, for reasons that cannot be elaborated here, Plato seems to believe in reincarnation and the immortality of the soul. Specifically, he supposed that before birth, every soul had actually inhabited the eternal world of ideas, where it was able to endlessly and blissfully contemplate all forms. This is, you may say, the Platonic version of paradise. However, Plato went on to say that when assuming a human body, the soul has forgotten its supernatural knowledge of ideas. But is this forgetting utterly hopeless? Not at all. Happily, says Plato, every time it comes into contact with the things of this world, the soul is reminded of the primordial forms and so it can reach the truth again. How come? Well, that's because, as we just said, the things of this world are copies of the forms themselves. To take a couple of examples, every time I see a straight object, like a ruler, and I say this object is straight, what I'm actually saying is true because I recollect the idea of straightness. Or, if I pick up a ball and say, this object is round, my statement is true because that particular object reminds me of the idea of roundness, that my soul knew before acquiring a body. Similarly, whenever I experience something beautiful, for instance, a beautiful painting or a beautiful landscape, my soul glimpses for a moment the timeless idea of beauty, which it contemplated before being born. Such recollections allow my soul to become reacquainted with the truth of eternal forms and so to gain genuine knowledge. This is, in a nutshell, Plato's theory of knowledge as recollection. There's something else you should know about Plato's epistemology. Namely, Plato insists that it is only through reason that we reach the truth, i.e. knowledge of forms. The sense is give us only opinions about reality, and opinions can never constitute absolute knowledge. Why? 
Because, explains Plato, the objects of our sensorial experience are always changing. They never stay the same. They appear and disappear at some point in time. Moreover, even during their existence, they are in a perpetual state of flux. And even if the changes they are subjected to might be minuscule, external objects are never self-identical. Examples, please. Look at our bodies, which, as any competent medical doctor can tell you, are continuously changing. If anything, all human bodies are getting older and older every single instant. Moving to fruits and vegetables, they also have a life cycle of their own. They grow, get ripe, decay and disappear. If you think mountains or rocks are different, think twice. Every natural hard surface is continuously eroded by wind, water, ice and sand. Consider also an enormous thing like our planet. Does it have a life of its own, a date of birth and an expected death? All astrophysicists answer yes. Moreover, climatologists use every single opportunity to remind us that the Earth is a living entity liable to endless changes. Even if he didn't know as much as we do about our planet, Plato did know that nothing is permanent in the physical world. He was confirmed in this by direct experience, i.e. by his bodily senses. What he saw, heard, smelled, touched and tasted showed him that nothing stays the same. At the same time, whereas worldly things are continually changing, forms remain essentially changeless. Thus, reasons Plato, the source of true knowledge could never be sense experience. Because visible things are constantly shifting, the senses which are in direct contact with them could never lead to certain knowledge. Rather, since the changeless everlasting forms constitute the true reality, while reason is the unique means to know them, it logically follows that true knowledge comes exclusively from reason. Precisely because our senses are fallible and could produce only opinions, the only hope for knowledge we have lies in our mind. In this way, Plato was able to argue that we do have the capacity to discover the truth because we can know or recollect the forms. And we know the forms because we have a soul endowed with reason whose immortality allowed it to contemplate the eternal ideas before being born into a human body. In sum, how can we characterize Plato's epistemology? I would say that it has three fundamental features. Plato's epistemology is first idealistic because it regards incorporeal ideas as most real and in consequence denies the significance of the corporeal experience of the world. The second feature consists of its rationalistic core. As he denies that knowledge could ever come from our senses, Plato proclaims reason as the unique source of infallible knowledge. Rational, critical thinking, which distrusts all sensorial experience, is the only means of knowing reality. Thirdly, the Platonic epistemology is mystical inasmuch as it postulates the existence of a transcendent realm of forms which it considers the sole object worthy of our knowledge and awe. In general, Plato's theory of knowledge is paramount for the period before the scientific revolution in Western Europe. But you may wonder how much did epistemology actually change since Plato? The answer is somewhat ambiguous. That's because modern epistemology will have become both a continuation of and a radical departure from its ancient ancestors. Briefly stated, to the extent that it rejects the existence of eternal independent forms, modern epistemology is completely different from Plato's philosophy. 
At the same time, since a large part of it continued to rely heavily upon the knowing powers of reason without completely abandoning religious references, modern epistemology remained relatively platonic. Next, I will draw in very crude strokes the outline of modern epistemology between the 17th and 18th century. Specifically, I will deal with modernity's reigning theories of knowledge, rationalism and empiricism. We shall see that, just like Plato, modern rationalism enshrines reason as the ultimate criterion for determining the truth and celebrates the fact that all human beings are capable of rational thought. Empiricism, on the other hand, argues that the only source of genuine knowledge is our sensorial experience, i.e. what we know through our five senses. Rationalism privileges sound logical arguments based on deductions from universally accepted premises. By contrast, empiricism stresses the importance of inference from concrete observations and the necessity of empirical proof for every theoretical statement about the world. I will start with the founder of the rationalist tradition and one of the most illustrious figures in the history of epistemology, René Descartes. Considered the father of modern European philosophy, René Descartes is a typical representative of the emerging scientific worldview. An independent spirit and brilliant mathematician, he refused to defer to any intellectual authority besides that of his own intellect. He was not willing to admit anything as true which could not be proved rationally evident. To this day, Descartes' epistemological project sounds very bold indeed, as he decided to set aside all metaphysical speculations and epistemological theories before him. What he wanted to find was, one, a reliable method for all branches of human inquiry, two, indisputable principles to be used as the basis for all sciences and so for unerring knowledge. But how did he manage to do that? The answer is through a radical doubt. His strategy was to view everything as possibly untrue. Before proceeding any further, a quick clarification is in order. Descartes was never a skeptic. He initiated this whole project being confident that true knowledge was possible and that he would discover propositions which could no longer be doubted. Basically, Descartes' skepticism was purely instrumental. Descartes strongly believed that the aforementioned doubt would lead to something absolutely certain. As we shall soon see, fully committed skeptics do not think that's ever possible. With that in mind, don't make the mistake of counting Descartes as one of them. Getting back to the main argument, Descartes began by considering questionable whatever knowledge he got from school and books. Nothing he read or learned, he confessed, was absolutely indisputable. There was an enormous room for uncertainty, and therefore for error, in the body of knowledge he inherited. What about himself, his own experience of the world? Could he doubt that too? His potentially shocking answer was yes, and his justification was that he couldn't be sure at all whether he was dreaming or not. When we dream, he explained, we don't know we are dreaming. Furthermore, in dreams, we still have a sense experience of some kind. We see, hear, and touch. Some of us dream even of smells and tastes. Whatever the case, Descartes insisted that there was no fundamental difference between dreaming and being awake in terms of what we perceive at any moment in time. As a result, he could reasonably doubt that his bodily experience was true. But what about his mental experience? Could he doubt that too? Here, Descartes was faced with a tremendous difficulty. That's because the mind seems to possess truths which are seemingly impossible to doubt. 
What kind of truths? Uh, mathematical truths, to take the most obvious example. Could anybody doubt that 2 plus 2 makes 4? Yet, even in this instance, Descartes found reason to doubt, but interestingly enough, only by showing his religious inclinations. He argued that an utterly demonic spirit or evil genius could have taken possession of him and instilled in his mind certainties like the one which states that 2 plus 2 makes 4. Could that be true? The problem is, it could, although there's no way to find out. Thus, Descartes deemed the possibility, no matter how minuscule, that an evil genius may deceive him in this manner sufficient enough to doubt even mathematical truths. But is this a completely hopeless situation? Fortunately, Descartes does discover a way out. He realizes that insofar as he doubts, he is engaged in a process of thinking or reflection. Indeed, he could doubt absolutely everything, but he could not doubt that he was doubting and therefore thinking. Moreover, he observes that any thinking requires somebody or an agent who thinks. There's no such thing as incorporeal minds floating in the air. Minds exist only in individual human beings. Let's rephrase the argument so far. 1. No one can doubt that while doubting, one is thinking. 2. There's no such thing as thinking without a thinker. Ergo, the one who doubts cannot doubt that he or she exists. Descartes offered a brief formula for this syllogism, which became very famous. It runs thus. Dubito ergo cogito, cogito ergo sum. I doubt, therefore I think, I think, therefore I am. The wonderful thing is that these two propositions, or principles, are not true just for Descartes. They hold true for anyone capable of reasoning, i.e. for all human beings. In other words, they contain a truth that can never be disputed. Now that he showed that true knowledge is possible, Descartes has to explain how we come about it. Here he turns to another introspective reflection. He says that he could not conceive himself except as thinking. However hard he tried, he could find no other property besides thought which belonged to him more intimately. Thereby, he decided that he was human only insofar as he was a thinking thing, and nothing else. So, what could he say about the proposition, I, René Descartes, am by definition a thinking thing? First, that its truth is universal. It is obvious to everybody and applies to all human beings. Second, that it is always and unambiguously true. Therefore, it is clear and distinct. Third, that he has reached its truth only by using his reason and without any help from the senses. Consequently, the same proposition is rational. Hence, Descartes' conclusion that true knowledge must meet four criteria – universality, clarity, distinctness, and rationality. If a proposition does not have all of these qualities, it is open to doubt or prone to error. Instead of genuine knowledge, it is either a mere opinion or worse, an illusion. However, Descartes still has to explain whether we can know anything about objects or entities outside us. Given his previous statement that we cannot rely at all on our senses, how is knowledge about the material world even possible? The example Descartes uses in this context is a piece of wax. The wax he refers to is, to quote the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a substance that is secreted by bees and is used by them for constructing the honeycomb. A substance that is dull, yellow, solid, plastic, when warm? 
and that is composed primarily of a mixture of esters, hydrocarbons, and fatty acids. End of quote. You can forget the exact chemical composition of wax. That's not what interests us here. What interests us is that wax has a certain density, texture, shape, and size, as well as a yellowish color, a pretty flat taste, and as far as I'm concerned, a wonderful perfume. According to Descartes, we perceive all of these qualities by coming into direct contact with the wax, more exactly through our sight, touch, uh, smell, and taste. If you imagine a piece of wax, by simply looking at it, you should be able to describe without any problem its color, shape, and size. If you're close enough and the wax is natural, you could even feel its scent. But now, uh, pretend that you have a fireplace in the house. Were you to throw the wax in the fire, you would see that its hardness, size, and shape changed, and that it even smelled differently. Please don't try this at home, since hot wax can burn or damage your skin, not to mention the danger of fire. I'm sure you can find a video on YouTube about the different properties of wax when heated. At the end of our little imaginary experiment, it seems that the senses tell us that wax can be both hard and liquid, yellow and almost transparent, with a definite shape and shapeless. But that can be right, realized Descartes. This is why he concludes that the senses reveal only the accidental qualities of objects. Descartes uses the word accidental to convey the changing character of wax and any other object for that matter. Implicitly, this means that the senses cannot tell us anything about the essence of wax, what wax truly is. But do objects have an essence, and if so, who or what could give us access to it? Yes, answers Descartes. All entities in the world do have an essence which we could grasp through our reason. Why reason? Because when asking what is common and indispensable to all objects, the rational answer is that they all exist in space. No one can conceive a worldly object as having no dimension or taking no room in space. As a result, reason tells me that what is essential to every entity in the visible world consists of its dimension, or to use Descartes' own terminology, its extension. Hence Descartes' conclusion that only the mind can know the essence of physical things, that is to say their extension, whereas the senses provide only knowledge of their accidental properties. Now, let's look more closely at the proposition the essence of physical objects is their existence in space, their extension. We should easily see that this statement is universally valid to the extent that all objects appear like this to all people. Next, the statement is unambiguous, i.e. both clear and distinct. The meaning of this proposition cannot be interpreted in more than one way. Also, the proposition is rational, because, Descartes thought, it can be reached at as the conclusion of an abstract, logical deduction, and not thanks to sensorial experience. That said, according to Descartes' own criteria, the proposition, the essence of physical objects is their extension, cannot be doubted under any circumstance. It deserves the title of true knowledge. It is now time to summarize Descartes' epistemology. Herein, knowledge of the truth, one, can be acquired by humankind, two, targets the essence of things, three, is obtained only through reason, and four, consists exclusively of clear and distinct ideas. At bottom, 
Descartes refuses to grant senses any say in the acquisition of indubitable knowledge. This particular aspect of his epistemological theory was something that the English philosopher John Locke took issue with. Please join me in the next video to see why. Thanks so much for watching.